Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so much for coming. And a big thanks to Dawn and everybody else at York University for, for inviting me. Um, forced me to think about a lot of things, um, and uh, it's a great opportunity to tell you where my current thinking is, and hopefully for you to tell me um, what makes sense and, and what I'm saying that is, is wrong. So I'm an astronomer, and I love saying that because ever since I was three years old, I wanted to be an astronomer. And I can't, I don't, had no, never had any plan B, it's the only thing I ever wanted to do, and it's an incredible privilege and a gift that I get to do uh, what I always wanted. In any case, I read this book and I was totally hooked, and it was the only thing uh, I've ever wanted to do. And so I'm very conscious of my upbringing, my socioeconomic status, my education, that allowed me to do what I, ever want, what I always wanted to do. And I always look back thinking there was never any doubt that I was going to be an astronomer because I wanted it so badly. And it was only much later that I realised that there are probably lots of other people like me who were just as focused and determined and driven to be astronomers for whom, for reasons beyond their control, things didn't work out. And that, that was a real light bulb for me when I realised that it wasn't my force of will or my desire, but my, my privilege and my luck and my fortune that allowed me to get where I am. So this is the book that my parents got me when I was three years old. I still have this book. Um, and just to prove that I was focused on astronomy from a very early age, when I was about seven, uh, I went to what in Sydney is called the Royal Easter Show. The equivalent here would be the, would be the C&E. And I asked, there was someone sitting in Sideshow Alley drawing caricatures. And I begged my parents to draw a cartoon of me. And uh, they said, OK. And I sat down. And the artist said, well, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I said, an astronomer. And um, here is me at about the age of seven. Um, I'm not sure what constellation this is, and this isn't the sort of telescope I use, but ever since I was a child, I wanted to be an astronomer. But as I said, there's a flip side to this, and that some people don't get to be what they always wanted. Um, I've always been aware of this, um, but a, fr a friend of mine um, in Australia just recently produced this video about herself and a friend. It's been anonymized, but I know one of the people involved in this. And this just came out on YouTube a couple of weeks ago, and it really, to me, uh, captures at a visceral level that things aren't fair. So um, I'll just play this video and then I'll talk more about what we can do about it.
So that, uh, when I first saw that video, I had a very emotional reaction. Um, and it raises, I think, many, many complicated issues that I can't hope to address in this short talk. But I think every time someone says to you that they got where they were because of hard work, or that you make your own luck, or that you've got to pull yourself up by your bootstraps, I think this video is a good rebuttal to show that, well, that's important, but that the system is not level and that things, um, things can go wrong. So, I don't, as I said, I don't propose to address all of the many complex issues in here, but I just want to set the story for my own field of astronomy. So, another thing you hear about astronomy is, and of many fields in science, is that things are better now, that things were bad before, but now everything is great. Um, and so here's a, a, a graph showing you that things are better. So this is just for my field of astronomy, um, in statistics for the United States. Uh, we have very little data in Canada of this sort, which is somewhat frustrating. But you can see that the fraction of women doing bachelor's degrees in astronomy has sort of improved from 10% up to 40%. And uh, the fraction of women doing PhDs has gone from 5% up to a third. So yay, we now have much healthier um, balances of men versus women um, studying astronomy. However, I think this plot is very misleading because it shows you what things look like at the beginning of a career. Um, another way of looking at this is uh, a plot that people call the scissors diagram because uh, it looks like a pair of scissors. Um, and this is a plot of the fraction of women and the fraction of, fraction of women in blue and the fraction of men in red at different levels. So this is a plot from Australia showing you at the bachelor's level in physical sciences honours, doctorate, sort of assistant professor, associate professor, full professor. And you can see at the bachelor's level, uh, the physical science is actually dominated by women, but that beyond sort of the postdoc level, things um, change quite dramatically. So this is what things look like in Australia where you have a pair of scissors. Well, in, um, in Canada, the scissors have actually broken um, because uh, here is uh, the women here, um, in the physical sciences, and you can see that even at the lowest levels, uh, women are only one quarter, and it just gets worse as you go higher and higher up. Another way of looking at just how steeply things drop off is this pyramid diagram. So this is data from about three or four years ago. This is showing the fraction of women in all of Canadian university research positions as a function of seniority. So here is bachelor level, masters, PhD, postdoc, assistant professor, associate professor, full professor, but then you go up beyond full professor, professor to tier two Canada research chairs, tier one Canada research chairs, and Canada excellence research chairs. And this number's out of date. There's now one woman with a Canada excellence research chair out of, I think, 27. Um, but you can just see how steeply this drops off. And uh, we were talking about this by email yesterday. A lot of people say this is a leaky pipeline, but it's not a leak, it's not a gradual drip. There are just fundamental roadblocks that make it impossible for some uh, women and other minority groups to break through. One of the problems is that we still live in this fantasy where this is how an academic career progresses. You get your PhD and then you, get a po you go overseas or somewhere else and you get a postdoc and maybe you get a second postdoc and then you get uh, a faculty position and you work your way up the ranks. And not surprisingly, as, uh, as a white male who's worked full time my entire career, this turns out to be exactly the profile that I have followed, um, and not surprisingly, I was able to get to the end of this pipeline. But the reality is that for many people, the, the pipeline does not look like this. And um, here is uh, perhaps a more realistic one. Uh, there's actually an arrow here that goes round and around and around in a circle that you might not be able to see. But this is the pathway for a lot of women, uh, that if you have a break in career and you uh, get a short-term contract with a high teaching load, um, you sort of get stuck in this cycle where you can't follow that simple path. I like to focus on data rather than anecdotes, but I just want to share one anecdote from my colleague Kathy Foley, who suggests that the problem is, is that for a man, if this is a graph of your sort of career path or seniority versus your age, that for a man, a typical path looks like this, that you sort of heavily, you steadily march up the career ranks until maybe your 40s or your early 50s, and then you sort of top out and you stay there, um, both in terms of seniority and maybe in terms of productivity, not doing that much after the age of 50. But with women, what happens is that particularly um, with the start of having a family or for other reasons, uh, women get stuck um, at a level somewhere down here and they either and often drop out of the system or are lost to 
to academia. And it's only if you can keep women in the game for long enough, when the kids have grown up or whatever, that they start to uh, become more senior and more productive again. And indeed, women tend to stay active and healthy for much longer than men, and their trajectory keeps rising. So you can argue that the area under the two curves is actually quite comparable. But the key thing is that for women at this stage, that you have to find creative and flexible ways to keep them in the game um, so that they can get to this point and see their career take off. So for the rest of my talk, I want to talk about some of the things that are being done in, in my field of astronomy to try and deal with uh, this imbalance, and in particularly focusing on helping women in this career stage here. And I'm going to break this into different categories of different parts of a career because there's no one magic solution. I'm not going to talk about every possible thing we're doing, but I'm just going to highlight a few in red and uh, just leave you to look at the ones in black. So firstly, there's uh, at the coalface actually hiring people and then once they're hired, making sure they have the opportunity to progress. And so I think there's a range of ways in which you can help people at this stage where their career might fork in two possible directions. One simple one that we do at the Dunlap Institute is that every single job has to be advertised with a part-time option, no questions asked. You can take the job full-time or you can take it part-time, it's up to you. You don't have to indicate what your preference is till after we offer you the job. And I don't mind why it is that you're taking your job part-time, but we think that there's very few jobs that have to be done full-time. And by taking a job part-time, you at least give someone the flexibility and the choice to balance competing needs on their time. So while, as I said, we don't ask why someone wants to work part-time, the, the most obvious and typical reason is that someone with caring responsibilities for a child or for a parent. And uh, as you saw in that video I showed, that's often um, uh, something that derails your career quite substantially. Well, we don't think that has to be the case. We want to find a path where you can keep working along that uh, academic track while having a part-time position. Another th key thing that, that we, are, we are moving towards is for every job having very clear, explicit selection criteria and a basis for assessment before you advertise the job. Not after you advertise and not after you've read the applications and not after the committee has sat down to meet. And these are actually different things. One is what the criteria are to hire for the job and the second is how you actually evaluate against those criteria. And I really want to highlight the work done by the University of Michigan uh, in this area, who have been very progressive in making sure that they have um, robust rec recruitment processes. So when you hire someone at the University of Michigan, a postdoc or a faculty member, you have to actually, you don't just simply say, well, this person's excellent and this person isn't. You actually have to indicate in what ways you think they're excellent, scholarly impact, research funding, teaching, and so on. And what's more, you have to say how, on what basis, you actually made that evaluation. So those of you that have hired faculty, I'm sure that many of you have been in a faculty meeting where the only basis someone has done is that they had a beer with a candidate and they really enjoyed talking to them. And yet, if that's the only box you tick in terms of your evaluation basis, then obviously that's not as credible that if you actually read the, the candidate's papers, you attended their talk or looked at their CV. And so by having an assessment sheet like this, it forces you to confess both why you thought the candidate was excellent or not excellent, and what were the actual processes you used to reach that conclusion. It's a very simple form. It doesn't disrupt the integrity of the search process, but it moves away from that attitude of, I know it, I'm looking for excellence and I know it when I see it, to make sure that everyone is actually evaluating criteria that they agree on. And you have to have a meeting before you see a single application of what these criteria are and which ones are important to you. And the other thing I wanted to mention here was that once you hire people, you then have to make sure they progress up the ranks. And um, a lot of uh, people, particularly women, get stuck at the level of associate professor because they're barely treading water or they feel like uh, they're just not good enough to progress any further. And I think that's not enough to say, great, we hired a woman or a minority, we're done. But you have to make sure that they have the same opportunities to progress up the ranks. So my former employer at the University of Sydney has these career development fellowships for women who, are, who the dean judges are, are ready in terms of the number of years of their career to apply for full professorship. And you get a fellowship to buy out your teaching for a couple of years so you can both boost up your research and you can prepare your application. So what about day-to-day -day practices in the workplace? Again, I won't go through all of these, but I just want to focus on what I think is the engine room of science, which is travel. 
In all fields, there are conferences where you share your latest work. In many fields, there is field work, and in my case, going to telescopes. If you're an astronomer and you can't go to a telescope, then you're obviously being held back in the sorts of data you can collect and the sorts of discoveries that you can make. So I think that people have to recognize that travel isn't just about having money, but also about having the time and the ability to go places. And people who aren't able to travel are at a huge disadvantage long term in the body of research that they can build up and the rewards that come from that. So here are some of the things that, uh, that I and my colleagues are doing to make sure that people are on a level playing field with regard to travel. One is that we demand that whenever you have a major conference, that you have uh, a spillover room or a remote room that's showing uh, a live feed of the plenary session uh, on a TV. And that way, if someone has brought uh, a child to the conference, um, then rather than having to sort of sit at the back and hope that their baby doesn't cry, they can actually sit there and watch all the talks. And uh, I've been to a lot of conferences where you have a spillover room full of kids playing with the adults sort of half paying attention to the children and half listening to the talks. It's not the same as sitting in the main lecture theatre, but it's nowhere near as exclusionary of having to go back to your room because the baby is crying. I think it's very important that whenever people, particularly men, are invited to conferences, that they scrutinise uh, the invited speaker list, the organising committee, the speaker list, um, and the policies, and simply declare that they're not going to attend a conference that has, um, doesn't look like it represents the field. So it's up to you, and it depends on your field, as to what a balanced conference looks like. But for those of you that are senior um, academics, uh, if you're invited to give a talk and you say, I'm not going because there are no women speakers, then it's amazing how quickly the program gets fixed. And uh, if you're not so senior, then it's harder to take a stand, but recognise that if there's multiple people saying this, then the conference organisers will recognise that they have a problem, and you can bet that they won't do it again. Um, more and more universities in Australia are, pro are providing means for people to either travel or not travel because of their caring responsibilities. So the Australian National University has a specific central pot of a dependent travel fund. That if you, go, if you want to go to a conference and you need extra money to go because you need to bring a partner or a nanny or a grandparent with you and you have to buy that extra airfare, then they will pay for it. The centre that I directed until I moved here, Castro, we announced a reverse travel funding scheme that uh, we not only provided uh, competitive fellowships for people to go and travel, but we allowed you to reverse that travel where you stayed here and the people that you wanted to see could be brought to you if you weren't able to travel. And I think it's very important to recognise a lot of people leave the sciences because of unsavoury things that happen to them that are illegal and are completely reprehensible. And it's important to make people feel safe and to send out a message that these things are uh, unacceptable. So. Um, more and more conferences are having a button on the conference website saying, I need support now, that you can click on that will immediately email someone saying that you are in an, um, an uncomfortable situation. And in astronomy, there's now a, a group called Astronomy Allies that are on Twitter and have a blog that at major conferences set up a roster to get people home safely from um, the conference banquet. Uh, a lot of people like to stay late or go out drinking, and then when it's time to go home, someone perhaps offers to take them back who has less than pure intentions. And so particularly for undergraduates and junior students attending a meeting, it's important there's a set of vetted and trusted people who can make sure that everyone gets back safely. I think it's crucial that you don't just go with your gut, but that you are up to date on what the best practice is, what the literature is saying, what professionals who actually work on these issues um, tell you uh, are good ways to solve problems. And so uh, there are more and more across the, the world these annual um, conferences focused on early career development and women in astronomy and so on. So here's a women in astronomy event we had in Australia a couple of years ago called We Are All Made of Stars, uh, both very astronomical and very focused on diversity. And we had a panel where this is um, the, uh, the head of the Australian Research Council, this is the head of one of the major universities, this is the head of CSIRO, the equivalent of the National Research Council. So you've got some very senior people who are running um, science policy um, across the country telling us uh, what they see as the challenges and how they can fix things. And it's really uh, quite important to get these people speaking to postdocs and students and understanding what the issues are. So we have, uh, during these sessions, we have external speakers, we have role-playing interviews, we have sections on ethics, we have speed meter mentor and so on. I'd say Canada is a long way behind in this. There are meetings like women in physics, but they tend to be a lot of talks just about physics. And I think there's a lot of best practice that we can pass on. At, uh, at the uh, Dunlap Institute here in Toronto, we have uh, about once a month, we have something called a diversity. 
um, where we get experts in to actually talk about particular issues. So uh, we, uh, we, networking sounds like some sleazy, dirty thing, but it's uh, a very important thing in, in academia to know how to network. And if you're shy or you feel like you're in a minority, it's a hard thing to do. So we've had presentations on how to do that. We've talked about handling imposter syndrome. We've talked about neurosexism, the, the, uh, if there's any scientific basis for the idea that men's and women's brains work differently, to actually give people information and facts and research on all of these different issues. I also think it's incredibly important to have support. You might be um, in a minority, might be a handful of a racial minority or a handful of women in your department, but there are many people around the world in your situation. And uh, while Facebook has its strengths and weaknesses, one of the best things about Facebook are Facebook groups that can be public or that can be private, but they're a great way to share information and to talk through issues. And so there's a number of groups, um, just for astronomy, that really allow people to recognize they're not alone, to ask for help, to share ideas, to learn. And so some of them are the equity inclusion in astronomy group, uh, a group called Astronomer Woman Mum, and L LGBTIQ astrophysicists. These are groups um, with, some of them are, are very formal with strict rules, Others are very open and are just essentially chat rooms, but these are sort of groups that anyone in any discipline can create and have a really important forum for making connections to people on the other side of the world who are going through the same things as you. And looking at the country as a whole, I think the most uh, ambitious but most exciting things, this idea of accreditation, of actually having all the people in your field come together and decide who is doing a good job and who is not doing a good job and using this and the associated market forces to lift everybody up. So uh, in Australian astronomy we have st started a scheme that called the Pleiades Awards that is uh, completely unapolog unapologetically a, a, a total ripoff of a scheme in the United Kingdom called Athena Swan that we, uh, we replicated with their blessing. And the idea is, is that you articulate standards for how well you're doing on equity and diversity. Um, and there's a bronze standard, a silver standard, and a gold standard. These standards are quite detailed, but essentially the bronze standard says, um, we know we have a problem. The silver standard says, we know we have a problem and we're actually doing something about it. And the gold standard, which is intended to be very hard to get, is uh, we actually have made enormous strides in fixing things. And so what uh, the community did is it set out um, uh, its standards and it defined all the departments and groups and institutes that were eligible for these awards and then it called for nominations. Um, and so every single astronomy group applied, no one wanted to be left out. Um, nobody got gold in the first year. Two organisations got silver and I was very proud to say that the one that I ran was one of them and uh, about half a dozen others got bronze and the rest got nothing. So the second round, it's, it's awarded every two years, so the second round has just opened and you can bet that those organisations that got nothing are desperate to get on the board and those that got silver and bronze are desperate not to be downgraded. Uh, those that got these awards put them on their web page, they mention it in their job ads and you can imagine that if you're looking at different jobs say in Australia, trying to decide which place to apply to, and this is an issue that's important to you, then a place that is accredited as having a, a silver Pleiades award might be a more appealing place than it has a bronze, and that again might be more appealing than a place that doesn't have any accreditation at all. Now in the UK, the Athena Swan scheme isn't just in one field, it's national, it covers all fields in science, it covers the individual departments and faculties and whole universities, and they are actually considering the possibility that you will not be allowed to apply for grant funding unless your department has at least a bronze award. And so for departments in the past have said, we don't need to worry about gender balance. You can imagine how their attitude changes when they're suddenly told that unless they can get bronze, they cannot apply for grants. So this is very much a carrot and a stick approach. And I really think that, um, that there's no reason why groups can't come together in Canada and start a pilot of something similar. Um, the Athena Swan Award is, is run with funding. The Pleiades Award is run purely on a volunteer basis. It doesn't need any official government approval. Um, it's just a group of people uh, who've come together and who care about these issues and put together a scheme. And all these different schemes are very happy for you to steal their ideas with acknowledgement and to reuse them in your local setting. So I've been here for two years and um, as Dawn alluded, I was a bit surprised that 
how backward Canada is on these issues of equity and diversity in universities when Canada is really so far forward on so many other complex social issues. But on this fundamental one, things are quite different. And so um, when I came into the Dunlap Institute, there was uh, a lot of changes that I felt were important to make. So I won't go through all them here, but I just wanted to highlight a few of them. Um, one is I set up an institute code of conduct. Now the university, of course, has a code of conduct. But when people start their job at the university, they get this pile of policies this thick that they don't actually read. And it's actually quite hard to find, at least at the University of Toronto, uh, a clear guide to what is and isn't appropriate behaviour. So we have written a very short one-page code of conduct specifying what is inappropriate behaviour at the Dunlap Institute. And we ask everybody to sign it. Now, I don't, I'm just the head of department. I can't overrule the university's policies and code of conduct. In practice, this code of conduct is something that is not necessarily about enforcement, but it's about peer pressure. It's about me and the other senior people in the department saying, this is what we expect of you, and we're not going to behave like that, and we don't expect you to either. And so I think having a very clear message right from the top, before anything ever happens, that, you know, pin-up girls on offices or crude jokes are just not acceptable, really changes the climate in that it knows people, tells people they can feel safe, and it tells people that they have to act with respect. Second thing is that uh, when I came into the Dunlap Institute, um, I was surprised that the salaries of postdocs were all over the place. Um, and I, I, I won't go into the details for privacy reasons, but you, it's, it's well known that uh, when there aren't clear guidelines for salaries, that men end up earning more than women. And so I thought it was very important to uh, make a number of changes here. Um, I put in uh, a standard mandatory pay scale for all the postdocs in the Dunlap Institute. And I declared that when we offer jobs to postdocs, that while uh, the people offering the job were free to uh, negotiate or uh, make the offer more appealing as needed, that the one thing that we would not negotiate on is salary. That I can negotiate on all sorts of other things, on like the size of your desk or the date you start or how much we're going to pay for your furniture to be shipped here, but we will not negotiate on salary. And I think that sends out a very clear message that uh, if people are hired to do the same work, that they can expect equal pay. The other thing we do is we collect data. Um, I had my staff go back and do this, uh, reverse engineer this back for a few years. So we now actually know what the different demographics are of people applying for jobs, what the demographics are of people who are being offered jobs, and what the demographics are of the people who actually work for us because that's the only way to really know if your policies are working. And once we have a few years of statistics, uh, we will put all this data on the web, regardless of what it says. We made it a requirement. We have what I think is a fantastic colloquium series. We have really outstanding speakers running for the whole semester um, that we fly in from all over North America. Uh, we've made it a requirement that the um, pool of speakers must reflect the underlying pool of candidates. So our, our colloquium committee is required to understand what the statistics are in North America of women and uh, people of colour uh, and so on, um, who are at the PhD level, and the overall colloquium pool must reflect that. Because if you just pick colloquium speakers by thinking of the first person you know, or someone who gave a good talk at a conference last month, you will inevitably end up with a lot of white men. And finally, somewhere in, in North America each year, there is some sort of annual summit on diversity or inclusion or women or minorities. And uh, what I've undertaken is that we will, I will sponsor, I will pay the full funding for two members of the Dunlap Institute to attend uh, those meetings every year on the condition that they give a talk when they get back of what happened and that they give me some recommendations of things that we're not doing that we have to implement. And some of the things here are actually things that have come from attendees going to those meetings. So is this actually working? Well, it's pretty early days, so I've been director for two years, and this is what we're seeing so far. So we have 67 people. When I started, 11% uh, of the faculty and associate faculty were women, and that number's increased to 25%. Uh, the postdocs have gone from 27% to 50%. The professional staff has gone to 50-50, and the students have increased as well. Unless this has, hasn't been a crusade on my part, this hasn't been a demand that we hire women uh, over, the, over others, it's simply having policies in place that are transparent and level the playing field. 
And so you can ask, well, have we paid a price for this in terms of quality? Well, there's lots of ways you can measure quality, but here is a graph of the number of papers we've published each year, 2010, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. And you can see the rate of publication going up at a healthy number. And you can see also that our external income has also <laughs> been very healthily increasing. So while quality is a difficult thing to measure, I would argue that we haven't paid any price in quality by opening up the playing field and trying to hire as fairly and openly as possible. I want to finish with two things. One is the rebuttal um, that uh, this sort of activity is social engineering. It's about making people feel good about themselves uh, and it's not about actually about the science. You might be in science for many reasons, but many people say I'm only in science there for the science. I'm there for excellence, I'm there for discoveries and nothing else matters. The only thing that matters to me is making important discoveries. So I would say that if that is you, then there are multiple reasons why you should be really concerned about diversity. And the most important one is that having a diverse work workforce actually gives you better research outcomes. So if your goal is to produce the best possible research, then having a diverse team actually helps you get there. And there's lots of studies that have demonstrated that, but I like this very pithy articulation of all of that, that says that when you have to work with people who are not like ourselves, we tend to prepare more thoroughly and work harder to marshal our arguments and we do better work as a result. Diversity is beneficial for teams precisely because we act differently to people who are different from us. If the end goal is excellence, diversity is an essential ingredient. And I think that's a very hard thing to argue with because there are actually peer-reviewed papers, there is research that shows over and over again that this is true. If you want to be excellent, then it's important that your students and your young postdocs have role models. But as much as I would like to be a role model to young students, I can only really, really be a role model to those who's, for whom my story resonates. And so you need different people as role models because the young people coming up are going to be activated and inspired by different types of role models. An excellent department or an excellent university has to be able to headhunt and recruit the best people. And some people will walk away from a place that doesn't seem to meet their needs. So if you are flexible and if you are diverse, you are going to have much more success recruiting and you'll get better people as a result. I think more on a societal level, uh, it's ridiculous in a country like Canada where enormous amounts of money are spent on education to train people and then let them go and say, uh, we don't have anything for you. And finally, in a country that's deeply committed to human rights, um, you know, I ride the subway uh, to work each day. If I look at the balance of uh, ages and genders and skin colours on the subway, um, do I have a human rights issue if my department does not reflect uh, a sampling of the, of the city in which my university is based? And I think most of us would agree that it's totally unacceptable um, if the department represents some filtered version of the community. So I'll finish this by making what I think is a very important point, is that it's not enough to say that you are neutral towards gender or that you treat everybody the same or that you don't see gender or you don't see colour. Um, if you do that, you are being gender neutral and that's better than being, um, be being sexist or a bigot, but it's not being equitable. And so I think these are sort of the three stages that we go through. This is uh, a situation where you are being neutral. You are treating everybody the same and you're assuming that everyone will be able to benefit in the same way from the resources, uh, in this case indicated by these boxes that you offer. I think where we're moving towards now is the idea of equity. That you recognise that the playing field is not level and uh, some people need different approaches in order to be able to compete equally. And so in this case, the short person um, is standing on uh, a larger number of boxes. But I think where we really have to work hard to be is this third picture where uh, nobody needs any support, where we've recognised that there are systematic barriers and that we've worked very hard to remove them. So I'd say that we're sort of moving from here to here, but this is not enough. Uh, we really have to get to there. And then I've heard people even say there's a fourth one, which is you have to be able to give these people money so they can actually buy a ticket and not illegally watch the game from outside. <laughs> so, um, so that's from the heart. Uh, I do want pushback and I want criticism and I want, I want advice on how we can do better. But I hope that's a snapshot for you of what things look like in the world of astronomy and of the small steps that we're making to make academia a more exciting and a fairer place. Thank you very much.